Bless us, Lord, as we preach the word of God. God, give the believers receptive ears. I pray, Lord, that in this time of quick messaging, and where the attention span of so many is now so short, that you touch the people of God and give them an ear to hear and a love for the word of the Lord. That even as the word of the Lord is being taught and explained, the music is not playing and sound is not booming and yet the word is being preached. God, give us an appetite for the word of God. May we all know who are watching on this medium that the preached word, the explained word, the taught word, is much better for your soul than the, the entertaining praise break that seem to captivate the minds of so many. There come a time where you discipline yourself to have ears to hear, to hear the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Watchman. What of the night? The questioner had hope for the morning, but he had the fear of the night. Watchman, what of the night? Today's message deals with what is most, what most of us are thinking about right now what is on the forefront of our minds, you know. As, as humans, we have a natural desire to know the future, what will be. There's a strange dichotomy going on in America today. As the stay-at-home orders continue, as America is shut down, we're beginning to see uh, some interesting developments. People are beginning to protest. People are beginning to say, hey, let me open my business. Let me go outside. Let me um, begin to return back to normalcy. Let me uh, try. Give me, I don't know, give me the benefit. Give me credit for being an adult. I believe that if given a chance, I can carefully open my business, social distance, wear masks if need be, and keep my business clean and hope that patrons, patrons will come. If they decide not to come, then let them stay home. That's my risk. If they decide to come, we're open for business. I watched one angry talking head on the news say to some people who were protesting saying, let us open our business, let us get back to our lives. The news anchor uh, with an arrogance that is quite undeserved said to the people, who do you think you are? Well, he used language that sanctified people don't use or that that was a time when sanctified people didn't. I'm amazed at what I hear sanctified people saying now. I guess sanctification have taken on a whole new definition. It applies until you get mad. Or until you're talking to someone about someone uh, who you think the masses do not like. 
And so you actually take away, rob yourself of your own credibility, of your own holiness. You, you damage what people think of you as you allow your anger or disdain for someone else to cause you to fall beneath the standard, the lofty standards that God has given you. There's not a politician in office, Democrat nor Republican, that I would allow to cause me to use profanity and obs obscene language in uh, my opposition to that person, whether my opposition was just or unjust, whomever that politician is, the chances are they will, if we all live, they will be out of office eventually anyway, uh, but, uh, but I'll still be a bishop, hopefully if I'm still living and I'm here, and still be a man of God, and I will still uh, want credibility. But people are saying, um, let us go to the beach. Let us, let us, let us return to normalcy. I, I kind of chuckle when I see it. Because just a week or so before this phenomenon began to um, uh, unveil, there were talking heads saying that even if they do open up uh, the country, people aren't going to come out. People are going to be afraid. Well, the people are saying, we can't wait for you to open up. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's comical in some ways. And no one is saying, whether you're saying, hunker down and stay at home or give me credit for being an adult and let me um, venture out. No one is saying that they're, that they're not concerned with lives. And uh, it seems to me that people are trying to divide it today. They're trying to divide it. If, you, if you're saying let's go back to work, then they're saying you're putting Wall Street jobs and money ahead of lives. And if you're saying let's stay hunkered down, you're ignoring uh, the economy and, uh, and these other things. Well, I think there's a, there's a happy medium in there somewhere. Uh, because I actually believe that uh, it's not jobs versus lives, it's lives versus lives. The longer we stay um, locked down, the longer this thing go on, and, and it's, 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 we see it now, domestic violence is up. Different things are beginning to manifest as a result of people being locked down. And um, some, when you're too heavy-handed, when you're draconian, you actually, you actually promote the very thing you're trying to prevent. You can actually spark civil unrest. But what's on people's minds, you know, the Bible, is, the Bible speaks to everything. What's on people's minds is how long? How long? What, what's, where are we headed, preacher? What's, how, how long is this going to be? What's going on? What's going to happen? And our natural curiosity as humans are greatly multiplied in the time of crisis. Man, when a crisis hit, everybody wants to know. What's going on? We ask the prophets to tell us what to expect. For example, during the Gulf War, Desert Storm, books of prophecies during that time, books on prophecies became bestsellers overnight. Everybody wanted uh, an inside scoop. Everybody wanted to know what will be, where are we headed, What's going on? Even now, especially now, we pontificate, we speculate, we inquire, we search for answers. How long will this last? How long will this last? On a personal note, if I could ask the President of the United States a question, one of the things that's on my mind is, and I probably may never know the answer, and then we have such a, a wise viewing audience that you may know the answer. And if you do, please let me know because I don't know. I would love 
to know who were the people who entered into the Oval Office and, and had the, the pull, the sway, the authority, the power to tell the President of the United States that you've got to shut the country down. What was said, what were you told that would cause you to put a screeching halt to the greatest economy that has ever existed, at least in my lifetime, by far? And if anyone tries to deny that, you, you have to just deny the facts. Lowest black unemployment in the history of keeping unemployment. Last time more blacks was, in, was employed uh, then the last three, three years were during slavery. And during that time, we worked for nothing. Record low black unemployment, record low Hispanic unemployment. Praise the Lord. Uh, uh, women, record numbers of women starting their own businesses. Um, the Wall Street approaching the 30,000 mark. So forth and so on. We were winning battles on um, trade deficits and different things. And somebody said, somebody provided proof, somebody brought information that said, shut this down. I will say this to you, and I speak this as a man of God, as a preacher who hears from the Lord. I am a consecrated bishop in the church of God in Christ. My calling is I've been called to the pastoral ministry. I am a defender of the faith. I am a preacher of the gospel. I do not call uh, myself a prophet. I do not uh, carry that title. I have not visited any prophetic conferences ever. And I'm not belittle, I'm not, I'm not being facetious. I'm not speaking against those things. I'm I'm, I'm speaking for me. I'm, I won't tell you who I am. And uh and 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 uh, and, and I'm, I'm headed somewhere. And this is not to belittle any prophet nor prophetess, nor any uh ministry that God has called people to. Uh, in the fivefold ministry, I am more the pastor teacher. And yet God deals with me. God shows me things. I'll admit my area of seeing things from God is I can't tell you your checking account number. God doesn't deal with me that way. Um, things of that nature. And for those who has those gifts, I by no means belittle them. But I do see trends. I do see global things. Um, I, I, God shows me where nations are headed and what he's going to do. And we have spoken multiple times. And I have a word from the Lord concerning what's going on now. And I've spoken it before. I remind you again. What I believe with all of my heart is that we are in the battle that Paul said was already at work, already in play during his lifetime. He said during his earthly sojourn, Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, and he said in verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. That is the work of the Antichrist behind the scenes the global world leader. Paul said even in his day, 
it was already at work in the earth. I believe what we are seeing is the battle of the globalist. I believe and I am, and, and I am convinced that covert 19 is not a hoax. That the coronavirus is real. But I also believe that what you are viewing with the coverage and the things that are said, I believe that it is a pretext. I believe that it is all but a red herring. I'm not saying that it is not real because it is real. But there is something much more sinister than a virus being unleashed on the world as sinister as that is. I have my doubts. I know from what the Lord has shown me and evidence that things are not all, uh, is not only, they're not always what they appear to be and there's more to this than what you and I are being told. I mentioned to you uh, some time ago, a few weeks ago, I read to you a portion of a paper that was published by the Rockefeller Foundation. Paper published in 2010, 10 years ago, predicted how a pandemic can be used as an excuse to establish global authoritarian power. Ten years ago, the Rockefeller Foundation published a report in May 2010 in cooperation with the Global Business Network of Futurologist Peter Schweitzer. It was called Scenarios of the Future of Technology and International Development. The first scenario, titled Lockstep, describes a world of total government control and authoritarian leadership. It envisions a future where a pandemic would allow national leaders to flex their authority and impose airtight rules and restrictions that would remain after the pandemic fades. We already hear people saying, we'll never be back to normal. It can never be like it once was. The first half of the scenario already has unfolded. And it predicted, as you would read it, it predicted 10 years ago things that we see today going on 10 years later. I have concerns that this is a pretext because the numbers are padded. The numbers are padded. And... Uh, I believe that this is a pretext to strip us of our rights. I stand here before you today, and there are churches across America where the churches are empty. The churches are empty. Because governors, governors have told us to shut it down. Police have ticketed people for practicing their First Amendment rights. The news and talking heads, silly heads at that, are criticizing people for practicing their First Amendment rights. Oh, my, I'm, I'm, I haven't left uh, Isaiah. Watchman, what of the night? Um... I want to read something to you 
that gives you uh, some idea of why I have such doubts and why I um, have concerns. First, Fauci, God bless him. But you know, he's not the king and he's not elected. Amen. God bless him for what he's doing. But uh, this same Tony Fauci in 2015, in 2015, uh, under the Obama administration, Fauci was authorized to give a $3.5 million donation to the Wuhan Virology Lab. The same lab. The same lab. Washington Post have run articles questioning whether COVID-19 and other news agencies originated at the Wuhan facility. First, Fauci told President Trump that the virus was nothing to worry about. Then he reversed course and warned President Trump of COVID-19 COVID would utterly ravish the country unless martial law like steps were at once taken to curb the spread. Fauci misrepresented facts and figures and he artificially inflated the case, the, the, the case fatality rate by instructing the CDC to label all respiratory distress related deaths as COVID-19 fatalities. Even if the person had never received a COVID-19 test. If it was a respiratory fatality, if they died from having problems breathing, whether they were tested or not, say that it was COVID-19. When you began to pad the numbers and gild the lily, people like me began to have doubts. Some examples transcends absurdity, this article says. For example, in Queens, New York, a 23-year-old black male had been walking home from a convenience store when a car pulled up alongside him and its driver emptied a pistol magazine in his chest. Two rounds struck his chest, collapsing both lungs because he had breathing difficulty and was put on a ventilator prior to his death. He died two hours later in the hospital on a ventilator. They said that his death was the coronavirus. They did not perform a COVID-19 test on him. In Brooklyn, New York, another example, an 86-year-old diabetic woman. She was 86. Did I mention that she was 86? An 86-year-old diabetic woman with high blood pressure dropped dead with when her heart stopped beating. The New York City Medical Examiner's Office listed the cause of death. Coronavirus. The next day, New York added over 3,000 presumptive positives to the state's growing sum of covert 19 fatalities. Presumptive means wasn't proven. Didn't have the evidence. That's a lot to add. I didn't say added three. 3,000. Trump's investigative team unearthed a trove of evidence that proves 
Dr. Fauci compelled the state to blame all inexact, inexact deaths since January on the coronavirus. In doing this, it pads the count. If it's real, you don't have to play with the numbers. Y'all don't hear me. At least when I give my prophecies and my reasons, I give you something more than the Lord said. I come with facts and figures. Amen. I think that this is the responsibility of the preacher. I said 20 years ago that when this country can be comfortable killing a million babies a year through abortion, that our senior citizens better look out. Well, New York mandates nursing homes take COVID-19 patients discharged from the hospital. Now, listen to this. And this is uh, the Wall Street Journal. New York told nursing homes operators that they will be required to accept patients infected with the coronavirus who are discharged from hospitals but may still be convalescing amid more cases in the states in the state that are straining the healthcare system. The decision will draw pushback. The decision will draw pushback from some nursing home officials who have warned that such moves endanger residents who aren't infected by the virus because discharged patients may still be contagious. A group representing doctors who worked in nursing homes known as AMDA, uh, AMDA, the Society for Post-Acute and Long-Term Care Medicine, said in a recent resolution that admitting patients with suspected and documented COVID-19 infections represent a clear and present danger to all the residents of a nurse home. The directive, the story goes on to say, the directive sent Wednesday uh, to, to, to nursing homes which were viewed by the Wall Street Journal, the New York State Department of Health said, this is the, the, the directive. The Wall Street Journal saw it. No resident shall be denied remission or admission to the nursing home solely based on a confirmed or suspected diagnosis of COVID-19. In addition, the document said nursing homes are prohibited from requiring a hospital, requiring a hospitalized resident who is determined medically stable to be tested for COVID-19 prior to admission or remission. What they said to them is, whether they have the virus or not, take them. They sent people with the virus to the rest homes. Now, all right, preacher, they may have made that mistake. It was probably the 1st of January. Nobody really knew. Probably the middle of January. Nobody really knew. No, this happened 
the 26th of March. This late in the game, they were sending sick people to rest homes. Now, do I think that that was a mistake? I most certainly do not. I want to sound the alarm on this platform that there's something going on. This is why I say when you got to pad the numbers and do things that will cause deaths, cause death, we are quarantining healthy people and sending sick people to nursing homes. There's something wrong with that. Even the CDC, uh, which in my opinion, need to change their name. Centers for Disease Control. It seemed like to me of late, it's been the Centers for Disease Out of Control. Their early tests were flawed, giving people false positives. Then they had to shut down the CDC to get the testing straight. And then by the time they finished doing all of that, the uh, virus had just began to spread and spread and spread. This night that we're facing is a real night. But it is more than what they are telling you on the news. Seek the Lord. Listen to those who will preach the whole truth. The Bible says in Psalms 30 and verse 5, for his anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. But the question still is, what of the night? This night has been a prolonged night. I'm told that in Italy, they were, were instructed to let those who had the virus and who were sick if they're 80, let them die. In our state, non-resuscitation orders were given. Thank God for the first responders. They hit the ceiling. What do you mean don't re resuscitate? These, these brave first responders, they try to save everybody. They know that it is not their God, their job to play God to decide who lives and who dies. They should give everyone care. And yet, yet, powers that be in state governments, New York State and other states, said, let them die. There is something evil going on. Watchmen, what of the night? How long the night? Watchman, how long, prophet? How long, prophetess? How long, bishop? How long, pastor? How long, Mr. President? How long, governor? How long, the night? How long? I want to take a turn here. The funny thing is, though, as legitimate a question as how long the night is, the text will reveal that the reply of the watchman is so vague, so enigmatic, so baffling that it is tantamount to no reply at all. The answer that the prophet Isaiah, who in the text 
was the watchman. The text says in verse 11, the burden of Duma, he calleth unto me out of Seir. Me, Isaiah, he's the watchman. Gives, Isaiah is the watchman, he gives, it implies, the answer, excuse me, that he gives implies that we are asking, hear me, we are asking the wrong question. As legitimate as the question is, the answer implies that it's the wrong question. It is not an improper question. It is not an ungodly question. It's just not the right question. The question I'm preaching misses the point. You know, in communication, you have to try and understand the point that is being made in order for uh, to get the right response. It's a good question. It's a good question. I think everybody would agree. I think you who are watching would agree that it's a good question. If you think it was a good question, a decent question, a legitimate question, give me a few likes, a few hand claps. I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting better at this. Let me know that you're out there. Amen. Praise the Lord. It was a good question, but it was not the best question. You know, there's something to be said for hitting the nail on the head. Now, when you're driving a nail, the nail still goes in when you don't hit it square. But it might bend a little. It may take longer, but the true uh, carpenter knows that you, you, they know that you know what you're doing when you can drive a nail with one or two hits. Pump, pam. Pump, pam. They know that you know what you're doing. 20 taps later, they know you probably never had a hammer in your hand in your life and they're praying for your fingers because you're about to lose them. You got to, in this day and time, we got to hit the nail on the head. What of the night? It's the wrong question. Rather than wanting to know the details of the future, out of a sense of fear because we're afraid. People are unsettled. People are uncertain. Certain people, people are in. And this is, this is designed to bring fear because if they can keep you afraid, that's why they padded these numbers. Fear keeps you from thinking. The first thing that leaves in a, in a crisis is reason. You lose the ability to think. Devil want to just have you so afraid that you don't know what's going on. Rather than trying to know the details of the future out of a sense of fear, the prophet doesn't really deal with the future. The prophet says what we really need to do, he says, is that we need to return. In verse 12, return there. You'll lose your joy when I tell you this. Return there means repent. Repent and trust the Father. See, how long? God said, that is not the question. I remember when I was in the, the eighth grade, my eighth grade teacher, Miss Campbell. I'll never forget Mrs. Campbell. Mrs. Campbell. I raised my hand one day in class and she recognized me. I asked a question that I never asked again. 
I said, Miss Campbell, could you tell me what time it is? Miss Campbell looked at me and said, uh, Patrick, time will pass. The question is, will you? I never asked that question again Amen. to any teacher. <laughs> she didn't say I asked an illegitimate question. It was the wrong question. It's the wrong. She, she was telling me, Patrick, you're looking in the wrong place. You need to be looking at the textbook and learning the lesson. Because you might not pass. Now, for the record, I passed. I, I, I graduated on time. As a matter of fact, I got saved and ended up graduating an outstanding senior. But that was because I got born again. Uh, I'm glad I got saved. That's all I can tell you. And, uh, and I had to make up for lost time. And Holy Spirit would do that. Uh, when I got saved, I fell in love with learning. So, um, but now... Let's look at this. Let, let, let's, let's, let's look at this often overlooked passage of Scripture. Let me give you the foundation. Chapter 21 of Isaiah contains three oracles of judgment. The judgment is against three nations. Babylon, Edom, and Arabia. These were nations that were surrounding Judah. The connection of Duma in verse 11. You see the burden of Duma. And Dedan or Dedanum in verse 13. And Tema in verse 14 is their common location in Arabia. Now, Edom was on the border of Arabia. Dedum and Tema were in Arabia. A vast desert land, 300 miles southwest of Judah. This message that I will preach to you today deals with what God said to two of the three nations. I want to address what he said to Edom and to Arabia. Perhaps we will deal with Babylon the next time. The Lord knows. Verse 11 says, the burden of Duma. Duma means stillness, silence. The prophet Isaiah, for you Bible whizzes out there and you serious students who just love this kind of stuff, the prophet Isaiah in the Hebrew removed one letter in the Hebrew word for Edom and created in the Hebrew now the word Duma. So Duma here is Edom. Are you following me? Now, according to verse 17, I'm explaining the text. Of our text. It says, And the residue of the number of archers and of the mighty men of the children of Kedar. Uh huh. And Kedar is also mentioned in verse 16. The people of the region of Kedar were of the clan of Ishmael. Ishmael, Ishmael was the father of the Arabians, of Dedan, of Tema. So when he mentions Arabia, Dedanum, Tema, Kedar, and Kedar, these are the same places. Cities within the same geographical area. The Edomites were descendants, you know the story, you serious Bible students, of Esau. Esau was the brother of Jacob. The people of Esau, the Edomites, uh, hated 
the Jews. As a matter of fact, uh, Esau means red. The, 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 the land of Edom was rugged and full of red sandstone. And the people were bitterly hostile to the Jews. You remember in Psalms 137 and verse 7 when uh, Jerusalem was falling when the, and when the saints were under attack, the Jews were under attack, the Edomites cheered on their attackers. Said, raise it, raise it. That is, strip them, strip them. They were bitterly hostile to the Jews. While the Arabians, Dedan and Tema, did not, follow me now, did not become a partner in military oppression of Judah. They prided themselves in their reputation as wealthy merchants with caravans plying, that is, keeping the trade routes, routes supplied with uh, supplies. And the, the trade routes of, uh, of the east and west went through Duma or Edom. And the northern and southern trade routes went through Tema. Duma or Edom served the Babylonians. Tema served the Egyptians. And the people of uh, Dedanum and Tema although they never uh, went against Judah militarily, they kept Judah's, Judah's enemies supplied. Are you with me? And as commercial cohorts, they had, they had, they were arrogant. They had a self-glory. They, uh, these antagonists of Judah and Jerusalem, uh, these as as Dedim and and Tema supplied them. Dedim and Tema got rich. Those Arabians made money supplying the Babylonians and the enemies of Israel with supplies. Isaiah gave these people also a warning. I'm almost through preaching. Are you following me? Are you following me? Praise the Lord. Uh, if you follow me, uh, wave your hand. Say amen. Give me some clap. Give me that. I want you to explain. I love to. I love preaching the Bible. I, I think God's story is much more interesting than mine. Praise the Lord. And anything I can tell you about uh, what me and Pam did last night or whatever, an anecdotal situation, I think the word of God is much more interesting. Praise the Lord. Because... Uh, uh, our lives are probably uh, quite boring. So he says here, it is in, com in comparison to the scripture, no two ways about it. It says here in our text, verse 11, in this oracle of Duma, the watchman had said something as the inquiry was made. Elder Wilson, I, the reason, Elder, you find this interesting that the prophet Isaiah changed the Hebrew word for Edom, took one letter and created the word Duma, and he called Edom Duma, was because Edom behaved more like the Arabian than they did like their cousin, the Jews. Some of our churches look more like rock and roll, concert halls, than they do churches. Some of us, when it's time to go worship the Lord, we look more, we, we behave more like we're on our way to the ball game than the house of God. We we seek to blend and look and mimic the world. So much so that when we are called the world, we don't have spiritual sense enough to know that that's an insult. I've seen believers 
find pictures of worldly celebrities whom people have told them that they favor and they post a picture of themselves beside a worldly celebrity as though that is a good thing. My position is that worldly celebrity would never say they favor you and you're the child of God. Let us not try to act so much like uh, 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 Arabia that we would be called Arabians. He created this word and called the Edomites Duma. Oh my. And uh, the traveler who came from Duma said that he came, the text tells us, that he came from the highest point in Edom. He came from, according to verse 11, Seir. Mount Seir was the highest point in the land of Edom. Tallest, the tallest mountain. So what is evident here is that the inquisitor, the questioner, was not looking for a human perspective. For where he came from gave him a better human view. He had a higher point than where Isaiah was at the time. So the reference was to get Isaiah's uh, perspective from beyond a human viewpoint. What I have given you today is a perspective that Fox News can't give you. CNN will not tell you, and carnal preachers won't either. I'm telling you that this is the battle of the globalists. This is a battle for global supremacy. You got to bring America down. Her economy is too strong. She's too powerful. We need to, we need to weaken her. Well, what's the, why, why weaken America? The home of the gospel country founded from Judeo-Christian, the Judeo-Christian ethic. Oh yes, it's not a perfect nation, but oh, it's the most blessed nation in the world. And the Antichrist in this nation, they, they want to shut down the voice of God, the voice of the preacher. In public schools, Many of our children now are being indoctrinated with doctrines that teach them to hate their country, to hate its foundings, and to despise Christianity. What do you think this homosexual movement is all about? What do you think this LBGTQ movement is all about? I told you 20 years or more ago. Uh, I, 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 I told you that biblical Christianity and homosexuality cannot coexist. And I told you then that the, the goal through this wicked lifestyle and the promotion of it. You know, I told you a few weeks ago that they were, they were putting pressure on all the advertisement agencies to at least include them in their commercials. Have you noticed? In regards to what they're trying to sell, you see a sissy, you see a lesbian, you see a homosexual, a homosexual, this is by design. It's to, it's to cause you on a subconscious level to accept it. And many of you have. That's how you're able to sit down and listen to Anderson Cooper and uh, uh, Don Lemon and Rachel Maddox and the like, knowing that these people are living a perverted lifestyle. And yet everything they tell you in the news, you take it as law and gospel. They, they're getting to you. They didn't got in your head. They've gotten in your head. You're messed up. You better let God the Holy Ghost convict you. But let God tell you what's going on. I told you, I told you that they cannot coexist. You cannot take the Bible and turn it right side up, upside down. Any way you, any way you read it, forward or backwards, it still says that it's an abomination. abomination. Antichrist, the Bible said, will not have the desire for women. 
It's an abomination. And it cannot exist, coexist with biblical Christianity. Oh, so there is this movement. I'm giving you a point of view that's beyond the human eye. I'm telling you, it is the mystery of iniquity. It is the battle of the globalists to take over, to uh, usher in a one world system. That's where all the technology is going. They're trying to get rid of people. You got Bill Gates running all over the world, uh, taunting to, uh, the, the, the glory of vaccines, and he's no more a medical doctor than I am. All down in Africa, vaccinating little black kids, experimenting on our people. And then you got dummies over here who go along with it. I don't trust any depopulationist. Any depopulationist. If you are a depopulationist, I don't trust you. And anybody who is for a woman's right to choose, if you are pro-abortion, you are, by definition, a depopulationist. And if you are black one, you're a dumb depopulationist because the main one they're trying to depopulate the world of is us. Now, y'all, I don't know what kind of emojis. I don't know what they send up when you preach like this. Hey, that's called a bomb. But I'm giving you a view, a point of view that's beyond the human viewpoint. God has shown me. Uh, watchman, what of the night? Thank you, Jesus. Watchman, he asks, what of the night? The watchman is one who stands in God's counsel, knows what is coming, and looks out for the event. Hallelujah. So now he who learns from the completed scriptures what God has foretold, discerning his purposes, and not by speculative interpretation, but by comparing scripture with scripture and accepting what is therein made plain is able to warn and exhort others. He stands upon the watchtower in fellowship with God. The watchman says to the world, look out. I want to warn you of what's going on. Praise the Lord. I want to warn you that the mystery of iniquity is already at work. The questioner is seeking a comforting answer and is anxious in his inquiries. Oh, we all want to be comforted. We all want to be told that it's going to be all right. The Edomites wanted to know if the Assyrian menace is almost over. So... He went and asked Isaiah, what of the night? Will this last much longer? Look at the answer that the prophet gave. The prophet said, the watchman said, morning cometh and also the night. That is one thing certainly, the one thing certainly is that the night will end in morning glory. The night will end in morning. Weeping may endure for a night. The night will end. Hallelujah. But, but, but also when that night ends, I heard Isaiah say uh, that it will be followed by another night. Oh, Lord. The night will end, but another night is coming. Night, then morning, night again. Oh, Lord, that is a brief day of salvation would dawn. And they better use it. They better take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. Look at what God did for us. Gave us record low unemployment. He gave us jobs everywhere. 
Didn't he do it? Everybody's working who wanted a job. People buying houses, buying cars. Good God Almighty, the, the supermarkets filled with shoppers. Good God, look at how good God, good God has been to us. And while God sent us this morning, how did we do as a nation? How did we do as a church? How did we do as preachers? Did we preach against sin? Did we cry out against injustice? Did we cry out against ungodliness? No, why we were having record low unemployment, the abortion clinics were still filled. While God was giving us beautiful blessings, men were marrying men and women marrying women. Oh Lord, while God was blessing in our churches, hallelujah, preachers getting rich, they wouldn't cry out, and look what happened, a night came. And now that the night has come, all we wanna know is how long the night, what's going on. Perhaps the prophet was saying, after the Assyrian warlord, after the Assyrian overlords, will be, they will be replaced with the Babylonians. You see right now, Edom, you're in a night with the Assyrians. But the Assyrian night will end. But if you don't get right with me, that's going to come another night. That is, if you want to ask me. Verse 12 says, if you want to inquire, you can ask me all you want to. You can ask me as many questions as you want to. But you're asking me the wrong question. God says, I don't have but one thing to say to you. God says, repent. Repent of sin. Some of us want to get back to the good old days when the money was flowing. Hallelujah. We were having a good time, but with sin still everywhere. Oh, Lord. We don't have a coronavirus problem. We have a sin problem. It's not that the virus is taking too many lives. It's not that the government is taking too long to find a cure. It's that we've turned away from God. I hear the Lord saying to me, Oh, man of God, tell the world to get right with God. Hallelujah. It's time to get right. It's time to get saved. It's time to clean up our churches. Clean up our personal lives. Clean up, oh Lord, time. Hallelujah. To get some of us out of our ivory palaces and get down there to that clinic and save that baby. Woo, Lord. It's time to purge our choirs of sissies. Y'all don't like my preaching. It's time, oh Lord, for the white preacher to crowd against systematic racism. Some of you, you don't say anything because that will, it'll hurt your money. It'll hurt your attendance, but you gotta cry anyhow. I've cried out and it hurt my money. I've cried out and it hurt my attendance only for me to find out that I'm in the hand of God. And if the Lord be with you, he will hold you up. Oh Lord, the Lord is saying, Everybody's preoccupied with how long this will be. What we ought to get preoccupied with is saying, Lord, Lord, I'm sorry. Sorry for my sin. Lord, I'm sorry. Sorry for my negligence. Lord, I'm sorry. And I'm going to do what you said in verse 12. The last clause. 
I am. I'm going to repent. I am. I'm going to come to you. It's time to run to the altar. It's time to run to the Lord. When this broadcast is over, go. Get in your secret closet. Throw your hands up and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. Lord, however long it takes, I'm willing to wait on you. I'm willing to trust you. Yeah, yeah, I feel a revival coming. I feel an awakening coming. I feel y'all don't hear me. Good God Almighty, lift your hands and praise the Lord. Praise Him. Woo! Right where you are. church to try to become the frats and the fraternities. God is saying, come on! Ah, yeah! Yeah, Lord! Ah, come on! Come back to me! Oh, Lord! You, 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 those of us who are just laid back, the preacher has become a comedian. And uh, the, 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 the sermons of Friday Light and Connell. Those, ain't no room for those sermons now. People want to hear a word from the law. But they ain't playing. Nothing, nothing, like, nothing, like your, nothing like your savings going dry to make you want to hear from God. Nothing like being between your last paycheck at work and the government check hadn't arrived yet. Ain't nothing like that. Oh, it'll make you cry out. Good God Almighty. He said, don't worry about the night. You need Edomites. You act like the Arabians. You need to repent. You're so much like the Arabians that the prophet called you Duma. You're so much like them that he called you Duma. And many of us today are Duma. That's the problem. So much like the world till the world is comfortable with it. All these Christians, I get along with the world better than I do the saints. Duma. I'm more at home at the club with my, with my friends. I'm more at home with the frats. I'm more at home with the large that I am with the saints of God. Duma! Now you got Duma talking about how long, Lord. God says to Duma, I don't want to talk to you about how long. We're going to talk about how long. We're going to talk about repent. Now unless I be accused of un improper preaching, let me just unpack this, these verses and we're done. He says, and the burden of Arabia, I've already told you who that is, the descendants of Ishmael, the people of Kedah, the, the, the burden of Arabia in the forest of, of Arabia. See, Arabia, desert. In the desert, in the desert of Arabia, shall ye lodge. In other words, he's telling the Arabians, uh, uh, you better start running. Because you're going to run from your towns to the desert. Who they're running from? Those mighty Assyrians. The ones who are bringing the night. <laughs> the night. The Assyrians are the night. How long the night? The Assyrians said in Arabia, since, since Edom was right on the border, and the Edomites uh, act like the Arabians, so he included the Edomites. Call them Arabians, but then now he's dealing with those real Arabians. 
And he told them, no hope for them. He says, you're going to run and you're going to lodge in the wilderness. Oh, ye traveling companies, that is, you caravans of Dedim, the inhabitants of the land of Tema. You know, you brought water to the Arabs on the run. See, as remember, I told you the caravans were famous for plying their goods. They would go to the desert and bring their, their things. Oh, and that's how they got rich. He said, so, yeah, you did good. As the Arabians were running from the Assyrians, you came and kept them supplied. Because, you know, the Arabians tried to fight, but it was a waste of time. Because God had already pronounced judgment. And it says, oh, while they were running in, in, in the land, uh, the inhabitants of, of Tema, these are Arabians also, they brought water to him that was thirsty. Oh, they were fighting. They got thirsty. They're running. And they prevented. They helped with their, their bread, them that fled. See, they're running from the Arabians. And all this actually took place in 7, 715 B.C. When the Assyrians came against the Arabians. The Arabian army tried to put up a fight, but it was like taking candy from a baby. And so they ran and they fled. And they fled from the sword and from the drone sword and from the bent bow and from the grievousness of the war. I mean, the Arabians uh, beat them. They folded like a cheap tent. They folded like a napkin. The Arabians beat them like they were redhead stepchildren. And they ran and they ran from the Arabians. And these other people, these Arabians from Tema and Dedham, you know, they, they're, they're trying to be, they're trying to make some off the wall. But they're in trouble too. And look at this. He says, for thus saith the Lord. See, Isaiah the prophet speaks globally. This ain't no, I can tell you what, you got, you got a check coming in the mail. No, no, this is global. This happened. This is global. This is big. This is big. This ain't no familiar spirit. This is big. He says, he says right here, for thus saith the Lord unto me. Look at this. Watch this. Within a year. And it happened when he said, within a year, according to the years of a hireling, all the glory of Kedar shall fail. That is the glory of, I remember Kedar, the clan of Ishmael, the Arabians, the glory of Tema. The glory of Dedham, uh, the glory of Arabia. Isaiah says, in 12 months. Because you guys are, remember I told you in the opening of the text that they were prosperous. They were wealthy caravans in the desert. They were making good money now. God says, all this is going down. All of it in 12 months time. And he says this, verse 17, and the residue of the number of the archers, of archers and of mighty men in the land of Kadar, your, your ragtag army, if you can call it that, he said, it shall be diminished. Your army won't be able to help you. Then he says this, for the Lord God of Israel has spoken it. That means it cannot be changed. Now, at least, people of God, listen, church folk, at least he gave Edom a chance. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He said, repent. Yes, now, he told the, the Arab, Arabia, you're done. See, that's, that's the end of that, see. <laughs> you're done. But since Edom was kin to Israel, since Esau and Jacob was brothers. God decided they would give them mercy if they would take God's offer. Now, you already know that they did not take God up on his offer. The battle between Esau and Jacob carried on, was carried on by the Herodians in the New Testament, who were Edomians. And after the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, 
Edom vanished from the scene. You can't find Edom today. You can get on a plane and go to Israel. You can Google right now and pull up Israel. You can pull up Judah. You can pull up Jerusalem. But you can't find Edom because they would not take God's reprieve. He offered them an out. America, saints, what will we do? Will you take the reprieve? Or are you going to waste your time and just be preoccupied with, when are we going to get back to normal? When are we going to get back to normal? When are we going to begin? When? How much longer? No, 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 no. God, I'm sorry. God, for the contribution that I have made, I'm sorry. See, when you look at this on the natural level, Fauci, China, Wuhan, American money, all this stuff, okay? But God super rules. And God uses the actions of nations, whether they know it or not, to carry out his bidding. Because he's never not in control. So whether God call, calls this, God allowed this. But one thing for certain, nobody can consider the wickedness of America of late and wonder why God would allow this. See, we're talking about, you know, I want to apologize to the governor. I owe Governor Roy Cooper an apology. Because I have been on him for putting, putting the church in on the non-essential list. I apologize, Mr. Governor. The church put itself on the non-essential list a long time ago. We did that. We did that. Won't preach, won't cry loud, won't do anything but have a, a praise break when we do preach. When you do, we ain't preaching about nothing. We made ourselves non-essential. Have, haven't we been the ones who've been preaching, telling people that we spend too much time in church anyway? It's coming back. That's right. The governor said, you know what? I agree with you. I agree with you. Aren't we the ones? Aren't we the ones now who treat church like it's not special? Aren't we the ones who go to church in flip-flops? And, 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 and cut out jeans, praise the Lord, and pull over shirts, and, and f faded out clothing, and it's no big deal, and, 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 and we've gotten rid of the sanctity of the house of God. The, the governor didn't have anything to do with us bringing disco lights in, and smoke machines, and, and having these secular services. It wasn't the governor that told us to have put a soul train a line in our church it wasn't the governor we did it we did it Baba had all of had them down there on money Mondays marching for uh, same-sex marriage marching for adultery marching preachers on online on television and everywhere else cussing and swearing we made ourselves non-essential So I apologize, Mr. Governor. I want to apologize to you. I might want to send him a letter. Get the letter. Get the address. I'm going to send it to him. Amen. 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 Our church attorney told me one day, I'll never forget, she's such a uh, sagacious woman. I love her. She's full of wisdom. She said, you know, Pastor, Pastor, people treat your things the way you treat them. She says, if they're not special to you, they won't be special to anyone else. The church ain't special to us. The church ain't special to the church. Hey Amen. Look at all the stuff they're doing to the church now. 
Look at all this stuff. You go play golf all day, and then preach against holding the church service longer than an hour. Takes me an hour to clear my throat. I don't get warmed up. You know why? I have a sense of importance. And that's what explains why a lot of preachers on the uh, non-essentialists don't have a problem with it. They ain't mad. They, they listen to you wondering what the big deal is. I mean, man, I mean, look, we're online. We're still getting the offering, but, but, but we're non-essential. Jesus died for the church. But before Jesus judges the governors for putting the church on the uh, non-essential list, the Lord judged the church. And that's why we were placed on the non-essential list. Judgment had been passed. We're non-essential. You don't believe me? Ask us. Ask us. We'll tell you. We'll tell you. We'll tell you. We preach against churches for having church. Uh, all these churches, let me rephrase this. You churches who advertise 90-minute services, 60-minute services, 15-minute services, you, you silly man, made yourself non-essential. The ABC stole fights for hours. You know why the abortion clinics are open? I give them credit. They'll tell you, we're essential. We're essential. We have clout. We are essential. It is essential for us to get rid of black folk. It is essential for us to shed innocent blood. It is essential. Our Lord Satan wants the blood of innocent babies. It is essential for us to be able to sell body parts. And you know what? With this shutdown, they're still doing it. We, we fought to become non-essential. And we won. And now that they treat us like we're non-essential, now we're mad. The, the governor confused. Governor, governor said, I thought you would have been happy. I don't understand Wooden. What's wrong with him? I thought I'm got, they got a break. They, oh, my Lord, you could just go home. Isn't that what you want to do? Because that's all you guys to talk about is golf and, and, and your play. And, oh, my, I mean, that's all we hear about. So, I, look, I thought maybe I was doing you a favor. Duma. Most church house, most church bands look like rock and roll stars. All of them sitting over there dressed like they're on their way to the outhouse, playing in the Lord's house. Now you're going to try to be essential. No, you, no you, you're non-essential. We have worked for years to be on the non-essential list. We fought for it. We fought for it. You know, you know what we begin to call ourselves? Family worship centers. That's what we call ourselves. Remember that? For a long time. I didn't go along with it. I didn't go along with it. I'm a prophet. I didn't go along with it. I preached against it when they did it. I said, Christ didn't die to establish a center. Christ died to establish the church. Ecclesia, the called out ones. There's a so-and-so family worship center. We go family worship center. We got these worship centers, worship centers, and then you they accuse you being old uh, old school when you call where you go to worship at. Oh, I go I go to church. Oh, you still calling it that? That's what it is. Duma. We secularized, and now now notice the timing. You judge it. Is the timing right? 22 million people out of the job. Unemployment head toward 14%. Lives being lost. And, and listen, a lot of these big, big stores, 
ain't coming back. They, 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 see, the shutdown, too much money is gone. They ain't coming back. They can't come back. Because some of them were struggling anyway. Some of these box stores, they were struggling anyway. They were struggling because online was killing them. So now, we, I'm going to leave this alone. We did this. We argued for irrelevance. Carter Pearson said in his universalism that everybody's going to be saved anyway, including the devil. Well, don't that make church non-essential? Don't that make church non-essential? Now, what I was going to say, you judge with all these things that are, that are going on. Is this the best time for saints to start arguing online or anywhere else for having sororities and fraternities and stuff like that in holiness? Is, I mean, you judge it. Is this, I mean, you kidding me? With everything that's going on, this, this is where you decide that, that oh, uh, we, we were too strict. So everybody responding to the, uh, the movie about the clock says, I enjoyed the movie. And, uh, you know, well, the Church of God in Christ was too hard. We could use a little bit of that now. Because we've gone from that to you can come in and sing any kind of way. Anything. We could use a little censorship. That's why we close. We're non-essential. We did it. And we ought to be embarrassed. It's judgment. And it ain't judgment against the governor. It's judgment against the church. That's, that's why I say, Governor Cooper, I apologize. Now, I don't like what you did, but I apologize. You followed our lead. Barbara had church people marching in favor of same-sex marriage. March about it with a collar on. Non-essential. You're no different than a comedian, a clown. Ain't nobody paying no attention to the Pope. He's non-essential. He's doing a good job making himself non-essential. Because he's not promoting Christ. We're going to get along as brothers and sisters. I saw something stupid this morning, a commercial. Uh, this lady's a, she's supposed to be a psychiatrist. Uh, by the way, there's no such thing as psychiatry or any kind of real therapy that is practiced with TV cameras on. So these shows you're watching, where everybody's sitting around trying to figure out their marital problems, and there's a psychiatrist sitting there, and you know, with all them stupid little stupid statements they be making, they mean nothing. Your 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 problem is just your problem is just uh, it's just looking for a solution. I mean, say stupid stuff all the time. There is listen listen. There is n no no serious therapist would ever agree to doing something like that on camera. But the lady on the commercial says, you know, I just want to give a big salute and just be thankful for the human spirit. That's what I, that, that's what I said. Thank God I had the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Something else would have came out of my mouth with that, that kind of stupidity. I just thank God for the human spirit. And we're going to find your joy in your spirit. And we're going to heal yourself and then share some of your spirit with someone else. Duma, you, you, we better thank God for, for the God of the Bible. And we better thank God for the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I want to pray. I, 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 didn't, I didn't intend to say all this, you know. All this was a, in, my, in my prepared text. But God, you know what I'm talking about. But God, God revealed to me why we're on the non-essential list. We made ourselves non-essential. 
And we can't wait to go back to the good old days where we can be non-essential even more like we were before. Because you can't get them, John. You know, you, you've traveled. Part of what you do with Love Life is you go from church to church trying to recruit leaders and workers to save babies. You done heard every excuse known to man. You walk out. Perhaps that word didn't come to your mind at the time, but it will not. Duma. None essential. None essential. Won't, won't, won't for the life of you get involved in anything that matters. We just love to do fluffy stuff. You ain't going to feed nobody. You don't have no budget. Nothing. That's judgment. God says repent. I'm done. I'm done. I, I don't know what to ask for uh, out there, uh, but y'all know I'm telling the truth. My, I was talking to one, of the, one person who loved this ministry, and uh, she was telling me, said, you know, I deal with people every day, and she put it so polite, <laughs> who don't know at first how to receive you <laughs> because people are not used to certain things said uh, certain ways. See, people love preachers who don't talk about anything. No conviction. They're going to hell if they don't get right with God. We all, we, we all, I said we, I didn't say ye, we all need to get right with God. Amen. We need to be where the prophet doesn't call us doom. We need to get right. Will you pray with me? I'm going to ask the church people who are watching the born again, the spirit feel, members of our church and else, friends who are watching, everyone who's watching. I want us to pray a collective prayer to the God of the Bible today, a prayer of repentance. I'm not going to ask the Lord, when will this end? How much longer? Because God, God told me already back in the days of Miss Campbell, it will pass, but will you? When COVID is over, who will be around? Who will still be saved? Not just alive, but saved. How will we come out of this? What will we learn from this? Will we, soon as, as soon as it's over, go back to what we were doing before? Can if we want to, but I heard him say, night will end, morning will come, but another night. That's another night. And that second night will be worse than the first night. What the Assyrians didn't do, the Babylonians did. Another night. Pray with me. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you, Lord as humble as we know how. And we ask you, Lord, to forgive us. First of all, Lord, we ask as individuals for forgiveness. We failed you. You haven't failed us. You haven't failed this nation. Even as I said the other day, Lord, that you gave me, when it's all said and done, the numbers will not be how many people died from the coronavirus. It will be how many people who were affected by it, who contacted it, who contracted it, and that you didn't allow to die from it. Mercy. You've already shown us mercy. People don't have the flu and not know it. You get the flu, you know it. You can have corona and not know it. What does that tell you? God, we ask you to forgive us. We ask you, oh God, we repent before you as individuals. I'm not praying for my neighbor. I'm praying for me. And I ask my neighbor to pray for themselves. God, forgive us. 
Forgive us of our sin. We've sinned and come short of the glory of God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, there have been sins of commission. And God, there have been sins of omission. Sins that have been acted out. And then there's, there's iniquity. Sin of the heart. God, forgive us. God, wash us clean. In the name of Jesus. Thank you for salvation, but forgive us, Lord to our contribution to the moral decline of this nation, for our contribution, for the role that we played when we were silent and we should have spoken up, when we, oh, looked the other way when you want us to look at it, and we said and did nothing. God, forgive us right now. And then, Lord, I pray for us as a local church and as a national church. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. We're like the church at Ephesus. We don't love you like we used to. We don't love you like we used to, Lord. Too many, we've given in. We've given in. We've been infiltrated. The echoes from without. The echoes that sound so reasonable. That told us to limit our services. Cut this out. Cut that out. We got to get in. We got to get out. People got to go home. All that stuff, Lord. Now, God, you fixed it where we can't come at all. We made ourselves non-essential. The enemy slipped in. And in many cases, our chief end, our chief goal, our chief concern is not the deliverance of the people. It's not that souls get saved. But is that we have a nice, sweet, happy, quick, non-offending, beautiful worship service. And we leave the way we came. We made ourselves non-essential. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. We have not taken our national strength and used it the right way. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, oh God, in the name of Jesus. And then, Lord, this nation that you've made great, this nation that you've made great, the envy of the world. Lord, they're building walls by uh, November that should be close to 500 miles of new wall constructed. And yet there are people figuring out how to get over, under, or around the wall because you made this country so attractive that it is the envy of the world and look at what has happened to it judgment because while you were blessing us and making us great and filling our storerooms and our refrigerators and freezers and bank accounts and oh God closets so filled with clothes that we have no place to put them and all the things that you've done God while you were blessing even our poor are the fattest poor in the world while you were blessing as a nation we were messing forgive us Lord forgive us Lord Forgive us, Lord. Lord, we will, we will leave the length of the night to you since you control the seasons anyhow. The day will come when you allow it to. But in the meantime, Lord, we repent. We ask your forgiveness. Now, Lord, to every soul who have prayed that, this prayer with me, oh, God, we receive forgiveness. We thank you for it. And God, we don't want to be like the uh, Edom. We don't want to disappear from the face of the earth. Uh-uh. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give praises to the God of the Bible. Give praises to the God of the Bible. Thank you, Jesus. What a mighty God. What a mighty God. What a mighty God. What a mighty God. What a mighty God.
somebody's watching who don't know Jesus. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I accept you in my life as my Lord and my Savior. I believe that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. And right now, Jesus is in my heart. And I receive him. I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for taking away my sin. Thank you for washing me clean. In Jesus' name, thank God. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, the Lord is, and you meant it, the Lord has come into your heart and has saved you from your sins. Call someone. Tell someone that you've been born again. Get in touch with us. We'll respond to you. We'll help you to find a good church so you can grow in grace, grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you.